Hi, it's me again, Mark Wozniak with SCC. Hopefully you watched the video on how to set up the local touchscreen with LMV. Well, now we're gonna dive into the master panel. Uh, the master panel is the other part of the equation where if you have multiple boilers with local touchscreens or no local touchscreens, the master panel will tie all those in and take control of your boiler room operation. Uh, what we're gonna discuss here is how to commission the master panel once the local touchscreens are set up. Okay, now we powered up the master panel. We've made all the connections. Now it's time to set this up. Now the first thing you'll have to do is log in. The login is, the name is setup. And the password start. Once you put those in, hit apply. You'll notice uh, several more parameters come up and hit close. So to initiate the commissioning on this, the first one you should go to is system setup. Here, we will tell the system exactly how many boilers we have, what type of system it is, what the connection method is, and any other pertinent information for this system to function properly. So in our example, we have two boilers. So you click on the quantity, change that to two. Next, you'll see a connection method. Now, you'll notice we have two boilers here, and then uh, what comes up is via ethernet. Anytime you have touch screens on your boilers, it will always be an ethernet connection. If we did not have a uh, touch screen, you would have to change that to via serial connection. In our example, we will keep it via ethernet. That way the system knows it's communicated with touch screens at uh, the local boilers. Next, what type of lead mode? Well, you have several options. You have LMV hours, that's based on the run hours of the LMV. You have forced lead. Now what this pertains to is one boiler will be a uh, lead boiler at all times, the other ones will be backup. This works very well in say summer, winter application where a customer may have a small pony boiler for the summer um, operation and then two larger boilers for winter. Well in the summer they wanna run the small boiler at all times. However, still have the larger boilers as backup just in case something fails. Next you set like what type of load controls we have. In our case, we have LMV fives. However, if you were to click through these examples, you'll notice you get all the other selections come up. Then finally, you could select what type, what the color and the shape of your boiler is, and also what type of burner it is. In our case, we selected a generic burner. Next, you select what type of system it is. In our case, it's a steam system. Modulation type, you have option between sequential, parallel process value, or parallel. For a lot of the modulation type on the steam application, I use sequential. Display units is degrees Fahrenheit, and then total capacity. What total capacity refers to is, what is the total capacity of your boilers? So if you have two boilers that are 10,000 pounds per hour, two times 10,000, this would end up being 20,000 pounds per hour. Finally, system language, which in our case it's English, Automatic logout. What that means is if you were to walk away and say you logged in and you forgot to log out after 30 minutes of inactivity, it will log you automatically out. And then you also have screen saver, which in this case it's set for 10 minutes. If you want to change that, you just click on it. And what type of uh, screen saver type? It's either status or blank. On the right hand side, you'll notice there's a thing that comes up for expand enunciator. We do not have one on this job, but if you did, you would click on that and it would give you other options and you would just activate things. Uh, warm standby. Now, warm standby works when you have local RTDs wired to the LMV system. If you have an Aquastat, you cannot use this feature. In our case, we do have RTDs wired to it. We would enable this and uh, you'll see that it says use shell temperature. So what it's actually doing, it's looking at the shell temperature of the boiler. That's why RTD is required and not an Aquastat. Next, you'll see a number to it. Now, in our case, we can only select one because we only have one lag boiler. But if you happen to have you know, three, four, five lag boilers, what this would tell it is, how many lag boilers do I want in the hot standby? Uh, where this comes in very handy is, say you're at a job site, you have three or four boilers, it's summer load, meaning only one boiler is gonna run at a time. There's really no need to have three other boilers sitting there in hot standby. What this will do is if I select it to one, it will keep the first lag boiler in hot standby and the other ones will just remain turned off. Now, for some odd reason, the lead boiler shuts off, the lag takes over, 
the system will automatically initiate the next lag boiler in the sequence to do hot standby. That way it's always ready and set to go. Feed water type, in our case it's RWF55. We do not have a DA connected, no VFD. Now we may have VFDs on the local boilers, but unless we're using the Modbus to gain additional information, you always leave this as not connected. All right, now that we're done setting up the initial system, there's a couple other things we need to check. Uh, if you go to the bottom of your touchscreen, you'll see arrows on the right-hand side. Click on those and click on the tab that says IP addresses. Now, the only, I'm only pointing this information out because you'll notice boiler one and boiler two. So when we initially set up boiler two, you notice you set that up as boiler two address, that IP address will automatically carry over. As we add more boilers onto here, and we address them as three, four, five, and six, and so on, those addresses will automatically populate. Like I said, this is only for reference. Next, you escape out of there, click the arrows on the left-hand side. We want to cover custom tags. Now, in custom tags, you can rename these boilers to whatever you want them. If you, in our case, we have a B1, B2. If you want to name it uh, Boiler 1, Boiler 2, or give it a name, which I know I've been at some job sites, they have names for their boilers. That's all based on personal preference. You could also, at the bottom, um, change the flames if you wanted to. So in a lot of cases, we always use blue for gas and orange for oil. Once you're done here, tap uh, settings and go into what's called the input output configuration. Now here, we're going to set up the header sensor. Now you could wire in your header sensor to any of the analog inputs. How the system knows which uh, sensor it's looking at is by the way you designate it. In our case, we're going to use input number one. And for a header sensor, you have to name it header. Now, the system automatically knows that this particular input is for the header sensor that's in the steam line. The next thing we have to do is we have to configure it. So looking at the sensor, I notice it's a 4 to 20. So all you do on type is you keep clicking until you see a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. Next, you look at your sensor and it should be stamped on there what that 4 to 20 milliamp signal corresponds to. In our case, it's 0 to 150 PSI. So you make it 0 to 150. Finally, you could set high and low limits on there and the alarm if you want to. So you could say, hey, if my pressure drops, say, below 50 PSI, and goes above 125 PSI, maybe I want it to alarm on the low end, or you could have it where it alarms and actually locks you out, which I don't think you would want. You could have alarm on the high end, high manual reset where that will actually lock you out. Uh, what I like to use is a low high. That means if it drops below 50 PSI or goes above 125 PSI, it will give indication to whoever is operating that boiler, hey, there's a problem here. Once you're done with that, all you hit is exit. Go back to settings. Now that we've completed our system setup, there's only a couple other steps that we have to do before we can release this master panel to take control of our boilers. From this screen at the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a tab that says main menu. Click on that. From the main menu, locate the overview tab and click on it. Now what you'll notice is our system is disabled and there are no boilers available. Well, let's figure out why. Uh, the first thing you want to do is click on the, in our example, boiler number two. And you'll notice at the bottom of the boiler, it says boiler not available. Press and hold that tab. What you'll do is you'll get this screen that pops up that tells you, hey, why is this boiler not available? Well, we know our HOA switch is in auto because it's highlighted green. Our LMV is not in lockout, it's highlighted green. And our communication's okay. It's highlighted green. However, our LMV operating limit is not made, meaning the burner switch is in the off position. We will turn that on. And what you notice is now the circuit, the system is ready and to go and it's available. If you click on that, you'll notice the lead boiler, it pops up now as a lead boiler and you'll see that the burner is starting. Now that the burner is running, uh, what you want to do is Go to the bottom left hand corner of the screen where you see the overview tab and click on that. This will take you back to the main screen which shows the number of boilers app. One thing I forgot to point out is at the bottom you'll see a button that says local, off, and remote. This can be misleading at times. If the set point 
or the fire rate is coming from the master panel, you want to leave this on local control. If you're getting a set point from a building management system, you would press and hold the remote and now the master panel will be getting its set point remotely and then modulating the burners. In our example, we do not have a BMS system, so hence we will change this to local control. Once you're done there, there's a couple other things that have to be done before we're done commissioning. However, before we go there, I want to point out a couple things. You'll notice at the upper right hand corner, you'll see where it says 10,000 pounds per hour and that equates to 50%. The reason being is we have two boilers. Each boiler is capable of doing 10,000 pounds per hour. So hence, 20,000 pounds per hour will correlate to 100%. Because our header pressure is at 51.1 PSI and our set point 75, you'll see that the total percent demand is 100%. That means the lead boiler is running at 100%. Now, it would normally start up the second boiler However, it's not available because we don't have the burner switch in on position. Okay, from this main menu screen, uh, there's three more tabs that we have to configure before we allow the master panel to take over the control of the boilers. In the center of the screen, you'll notice something that says set points. Click on that. Now, in the upper left hand, you'll see W1, W2. Our W1 is our set point. Uh, there's also a remote set point to the right. If we were communicating, say, with a building management system, they would be sending us a remote set point. But since we are doing every, all the control from the master panel, that will always say zero. And it also tells you it's invalid and the remote is disabled. Going down on the screen, you'll notice a warm set point, warm hysteresis, and a warm min runtime. Now, if you have local RTDs wired to the boiler, it will actually see the temperature of the boiler. Let me show you an example. If I go back to the overview screen, click on this boiler, You'll notice at the bottom right hand side, it says shell temperature and it'll tell you it's 334 degrees Fahrenheit. If you have an aquastat there, you will not have this information available to you. That is why it's always required to have a RTD if you wanna use the hot standby or the warm standby feature. Now what this says is my warm set point is 275 degrees Fahrenheit, the hysteresis is 10 and the min runtime is five minutes. Now you'll also notice a browned out section where you have the PID settings, the set point offset, the LFH high force, and the modulation hold delay. Uh, each boiler is commissioned differently. Each process is commissioned differently. So what we will do is we'll uh, ask you to go into the manual to get more information on this. But please note, there's no magic numbers we could give you on your operation because every process is different. Okay, so from this screen, you hit the tab at the bottom, which says main menu. You'll get the main menu screen. Now we go to lead selection. Now what lead selection tells us is, okay, you'll notice we have one boiler available. The reason being is our other boiler, we still have the switch in the off position. We also have the system set up as force lead, which was set up from the initial screen. If we want to change that, we could go back to main menu, system setup, and let's change it based on run hours. Now, if I go back to main menu, lead selection, you'll notice my screen changes. Uh, I have what's called an alternation point. So after 96 hours of continuous operation on the lead boiler, the boiler will automatically switch, uh, meaning lag one will become the new lead boiler and lead boiler will become the lag one boiler. You could also do what's called a multi, uh, manual alternation to the next lead, meaning I can manually force it. Uh, there's also a lead change overlap. What that means is uh, once the 96 hours elapses, it doesn't mean the lead boiler will shut off and the lag boiler will turn on. It means that the lag boiler will come on, the lead and lag will run in parallel, and once the three minutes elapses, then the lead boiler will shut off. Now the lag one will become the new lead. The reason we do this is you don't want one boiler turning off and the next one trying to turn on because it could upset the process. A couple other things to keep in mind. Uh, you could have lead skip based on W1 or W2 set point. Default, these are always in rotation, but where you, this might come in handy is when you have summer and winter load boilers where you might want to take one of the boilers off rotation for some reason. And finally, from this screen, we're gonna hit the main menu tab once more, and we're gonna go to the lag start stop. 
this is where you commission on how your lag boiler starts. Now, you'll notice since we only have one lag boiler, we only see one lag start. Now, what you see is you see a 95% in 300 seconds. Well, what does that mean? Well, this is where the load on the system comes in or the demand on the system. If we go back to the main overview screen, you'll notice that we have a total 100% demand. That 100% demand refers to this 95%. So when our system calls for a boiler come on, when the percent demand goes above 95%, in this case, for more than 300 seconds, the lag boiler will start. Now, the lag boiler will shut down after the percent demand on the system goes below 95% for more than 45 seconds. A Couple other things, you could have a lead shutdown. Uh, depending on your process, maybe you cannot afford to have the lead shutdown or you could have it set up to use a timer. Use a process value. What this means is if our process value is above, in this case, two PSI above our set point, it will shut down the lead boiler. Or you could have it disabled completely, meaning that lead boiler will always run. Like I said, there's no magic answer for this. It's all based on the process demands. Because you have to remember, if our boiler, our lead boiler is sitting at low fire and our pressure continues to rise, if it gets high enough, it's going to trip the manual high pressure limit and then it will cause your boiler to lock out. Okay, so once all this is done, we are done setting up the master panel. From here, you could go to the bottom tab. You'll get the main overview screen. You could either click on boiler one detail or boiler two detail. Uh, you could look at your analog inputs. So if I wanted to see, in this case, we have analog input, header 51.1 PSI, we're not doing a totalization. But you may have some things that like say um, steam flow or water flow or anything that entails a, say a meter where you may want to totalize how much of a gas or water you're consuming. Uh, but once you're done with that, you could actually go into the overview screen and now you can let your system take uh, command of the individual boilers. So that concludes our lessons for the local touch screens and the master panel. If you need more information on any of our uh, devices, you could always go to our website, which is www.sccombustion.com. Uh, we have an entire library of all the literature on all of our products that we offer to customers. Uh, additionally, if you need more information, you can always contact technical support at 224-366-8445, press number two, um, or contact your local sales rep to assist you in any matter that may come up.